Um, so now recording has started. Thank you so much. Welcome everybody to this UNCTAD ad hoc expert meeting on the topic of the potential impact of decarbonization measures in shipping on states. This meeting follows another earlier meeting we had end of 2020 with the same theme, which at that time was very, very helpful for us at ANCTA to prepare us for subsequent work we did with and for the IMO and IMO member states, which I will present also a little later. So the idea of this meeting is to build on the previous one, to build on the experience we have to uh, we have gained since then. Again, just as the previous meeting, this is part of the UNCTAD work program. It is not an IMO meeting, although a lot of this is of particular interest also for IMO members and IMO secretariat and for our work in collaboration with the IMO. But I just want to make sure that the IMO colleagues who are in the room will not be blamed for anything that we say or, or goes wrong or so. So it is an UNCTAD meeting, which we are holding uh, to help us the UNCTAD Secretariat. So these ad hoc meetings are part of our research activities. They are not part of our technical assistance. They are not part of our intergovernmental machinery. They're really here for us to think together, to brainstorm. So I really want to start out thanking all of you for being here um, for to help us. And I hope you will also benefit from this for your work. Um, let me start sharing screen very briefly to go through the agenda, which I hope all of you have received, or just to see what we are planning. So this is this ad hoc meeting. I just went through the background. I hope everybody can see if somebody cannot see the shared screen, just unmute and shout and say no or something. But otherwise, I assume everybody can see. So this is the background, which was shared with you as an attachment to the calendar entry into the invite. I hope you've seen it. Um, if not, again, we will also put it into the chat. This is the background. The objectives of this meeting are threefold. First, it's the information sharing about recent research and outcomes of already done impact assessments. Here we also want to discuss similarities and differences between outcomes of recent work done by UNCTAD, but also others. Second, thank you to the friends and colleagues from the IMO Secretariat, but also possibly others, because at the European Union, at governments, at universities, there are others looking at assessing the impacts of future measures, economic, technical, about decarbonization. So the second point is like, what are the plans for future work? And third and last, we'll really be brainstorming different aspects to consider. Uh, including in this upcoming collaboration with the IMO, but also like what, what are timelines, what methodologies to use, different approaches when we assess economic measures or technical measures. Do we look at modal shift or only maritime? What impacts to include only the economic, but or also climate change, or also the impact of what we can do with potential money that is generated and so on. So these three objectives then follow the agenda. Uh, so where um, some friends and colleagues in the room have already been volunteered, uh, Paula has been volunteered, Ronald has been volunteered, and Pierre has been volunteered. I will start out briefly with what we have done there. If people come in, um, please raise your hand. That's the safest, so you don't need to interrupt. Not I easiest if you want to raise your hand, uh, if you want to come in at some point in time or you want us to add you to the agenda, raise your hand. So that is the first round. Uh, including discussions on the results and really discuss are these results the same? Are they different? Are they shooting in the same direction? And if there are differences, what explains those differences? Among the total of two and a half hours we have, plus minus introduction, minus concluding, so say each one of these items should have about 45 minutes. So I everybody promised me to speak only five minutes. Believe it. Last time it worked. <laughs> Let's see. Um, then, after this discussion of what was done in the past, second point, plans for future assessments. And there, Camille and Aide have kindly agreed to give us an update. This can be a little longer than five minutes. And there, I haven't really put discussion 
but more Q&A where we all have an opportunity, including us at Anktat, to ask IMO colleagues what, what concretely are the next steps in this context. And then the third and last point I've put here already up, uh, Harry Laos, Isabel, actually let me already now put Ono here, Ono from Anktat. When Ono and I meet, we always call each other Meister and Man. So Ono will speak from Anktat about what we do on transport costs. So it's a bit of discussing like, okay, what, how do we go about these even more comprehensive, even more complex, even more, uh, more into the future impact assessments? Uh, can we just repeat what we did before or what other things do we need to do? Um, I will stop here with the screen sharing I do not see any hand raised so far, unless anybody now raises his or her hand and objects. Uh, did you believe everything I told you? I don't see anybody saying no. Thank David also joining David Hamlitz. I see you. Excellent. So one suggestion. Uh, okay, you are all muted, which is important. <laughs> uh, when you want to speak, you can unmute yourself and raise your hand. I would suggest, if possible, switch your camera on. And you know, in the in the teams, you can when you go to the view button at the top right, view, you can put large gallery. Then you really see normally everybody. You know, at the top right, there's a button. There's a, normally there's chat people. I see we are 51 people already. Very nice. Raise hand. React view under view when you click large gallery you can see all those of us who have the camera around i think we want to see each other so those if you don't mind put on the camera stay on mute and if you want to come in at some point in time uh, ideally raise your hand if it's urgent and you feel ignored just unmute and speak i don't see any raised hands so i trust you are all with us Victor connecting, that's very good. Are you connecting from Australia? Yes, he is nodding. Excellent. Yeah, so we have a very global. Krista is with us. Some new people, I just see Soteria. Excellent. Thank you all. Franciela, Elisa, good. Okay, then I will go along the agenda. Item one was sharing of impact assessments that were done so far. And, and again, for everybody, including those who just came in, this meeting builds on the similar meeting which we held in December 2020, which is why some of the basics we are not repeating. That's why I'd suggested those who have the time or don't remember, please look at the previous meeting and the two and a half hour recording. Uh, so this builds on what was done. We, we don't want to start from zero. So we trust we build on this. We will directly jump into some of the assessments that have been done. And I will volunteer to be the first one and start with the share screen. In a second share. And I hope you can now see this screen that is the heading of today's meeting. This presentation is very similar to what some of you have already seen, for example, in a recent IMO workshop, but um, I hope still, yeah, I think it's an important introduction. So the background to the first comprehensive impact assessment we did, where the IMO ne negotiations on a short term measure, these measures affect or the measure, yeah, measure affects the cost and speed of existing ships. Um, and before IMO members were willing to agree on the shorter measures, they insisted on having a comprehensive impact assessment undertaken. So at Anktat, we were quite proud and, and I think can be proud of having helped with two aspects. First, to support, include the perspective of developing countries and B also, uh, to avoid delays because IMO members with good reasons needed some of this assessment before they would agree to advance. So it is possible that, that without our assessment, this whole short-term measures might have agreed, might have been agreed only say six months later at another MEPC. So what we did was really a puzzle with many pieces. Puzzle number one was the input which we received from DNV 
about the impact of the measures on shipping costs and shipping speed. This is a technical assessment, which we in UNCTAD cannot do. And that's important. We look at the economic impact for which we need, and we will discuss this today, uh, what is the impact of certain measures on yeah, how ship operators, how ships behave. You know? This then we combined with the ships and their journeys. And on the top right, I always provide the if the provider here, we worked with data from marine traffic. So we had uh, 34,000 ships, 27,420 ships with laden international journeys affected by the measures, several million journeys, 489,241 in 2019, which in our estimate were affected, would have been affected by those measures. By way of example, here you then combine the ships with the journeys, and you can see how many journeys, how big the ships, and also the distance traveled. So you can already visualize how um, yeah, to combine two puzzle pieces. This picture here, I remember, was done by Hide Nobu, who is uh, Anktat colleague, who is also in this meeting. Um, third puzzle piece is then to connect the shipping with the trade. Here we worked with MDS Transmodal and had um, like this where, where there was positive trade, 130,236 cases. Now we say a case, 11 industry sectors, so many journeys, so, uh, routes. Um, and this is, I, I call it cases because initially, and IMO colleagues may remember, many people suggested we should do a large number of case studies. And I was always a bit hesitant about case studies because it would never be 100% representative. So rather than have 20, 30, or which cases, we said, let's do all cases. This is what we would call comprehensive. Fourth puzzle piece was then convert shipping costs to trade costs. So we have to change the shipping costs and also the speed costs, the lower speed into inventory holding cost. Then we have to combine this because Ben Shepard, who I think is also with us, I'm not sure if I saw him, he said he, he may have to have his camera off, that's why I may not have seen him, but with Ben, for Ben Shepard's model, then we needed to combine this into one monetary item. But before we could do this, we also needed to say, what is the percentage maritime, because all what we calculate is, of course, only relevant for maritime. And then came puzzle piece number seven, where we put the ad valorem costs into the trade model and calculated the impact on states. This impact on states, this model was complemented by some, some annexes, which give us ideas about other aspects to consider. That's later on this uh, afternoon here, but some aspects to, to look at as well. But what really then was the summarize what I just told you then came led to this on the right change in logistics cost. When I say maritime logistics cost, it's the combination of monetary transport costs plus the costs of time, like if ships go slower, the inventory holding costs and so on. So these two together are the change in maritime logistics costs, which then lead to changes in trade and changes in GDP and also changes in global value chains. So these are the, the impacts which we produce thanks to the first, this, this change was calculated with uh, us with the data and collaboration of uh, UNCTAD, MDS Transmodal, Marine Traffic, so there and the base building on the DNV data. So we had these different cases and for every country in the world, we had the different cases, the change in time and sea, change in transport costs, and on the right side, the combination of the two. And the very right column here that says low case, this is basically, IMO colleagues will correct me if I'm wrong, but this is then what was afterwards agreed. By, by the IMO members. So this is the change in maritime logistics cost, but what does this mean for, for trade? So there we put this into the model and had a decline in trade for this scenario. Then this one had then an impact on the change in GDP. 
Um, and the, among the conclusions, the one text that was most long discussed among all the different things and the, I forgot how many pages, 150 or so of the report, which, which you can see it's public, um, the IMO members discussed this paragraph um, because uh, the question was, are we making a policy recommendation or not? Um, and in our view, and we stuck to our guns there, we say for us, it's a fact. <laughs> some countries, for some countries, the negative impacts of the IMO measures assessed in this report are relatively higher than for others. I mean, it's obvious. <laughs> Uh, aware of the resource constraints of some developing countries, including small island developing states and least developed countries, I will not, from now on, you will know these acronyms, SITS LECs, UNCTAD expects that some countries will likely require support to mitigate the increased maritime logistics cost, and so on. I stop here. I will now stop sharing screen and um, given time constraints and that we have presented this before. I would not really want, I mean, there's, I see one one hand is raised. Uh, good, let me, who had raised, it's gone. I saw a raised hand, where's the raised hand? Why don't I see the raised hand there? Gabriela, Gabriela, you have raised your hand. Um, come on in. I don't see Yes. Uh, yes. Go ahead. I do not hear Gabriela, and I do not see Gabriela. Is it just me, or can somebody just wave or say, "No, oh, anybody else hears Gabriela"? No. Ah. Let's see. I don't. See, I cannot turn on my camera. Okay, no worries. But you can but turn can on you your microphone. Me? Can you we hear can me now? Right? Yes. Yes. Could you explain a little bit what about uh, what do you mean by case studies? And uh, and secondly, uh, this analysis at the country level, right? Yeah, um, yeah, Gabriela. Um, I would love to, and then you won't stop me for another two hours to discuss the case studies which we did, which are well, published one, in the report. One case. What, what, the, what is the definition of a case? A case study. Not, not that you want to tell me each case study, but uh, what is the definition of case study? Yeah. So. We also did some case studies where we looked in more detail in for, into, for example, iron ore exports from Brazil to China or um, grain imports of Egypt from the United States, if I remember correctly. So we had a number of case studies, which each one has several pages and looks at how many ships and so on. These are in the published report. When I say cases for the quantitative model, I call it a case in the sense how many data points, if you want, for each one of these trade routes with an industry, with a country pair, so country pair and industry, this is what I would call one case or one, one of the 130,000 points in the quantitative assessment. At this point, I hope that has answered your question. If there are any other specific questions on my presentation, let me know, raise your hand. <laughs> um, otherwise, I would like to move on to the other studies that were done um, and then uh, discuss really yeah, differences in the, in the outcomes. Yeah, Gabriela, sorry if I'm a bit short here, but um, some of the answers to your questions, yeah, they would either take very long or they, they are they are in the printed report. And, but I don't want to cut the interaction, but we need to move on. So if I now have on my list, Paula Pereira was the one volunteered next. Uh, Paula also presented some of your impact assessment already at the IMO. And in fact, after your presentation, Paula, there was a question from the delegate from Denmark who um, asked you what explains the differences between Hoffman's results, which are not my results, which are big teamwork, but that was his word, and Paula's results. And you gave a long answer, which now we will get into more detail. Paula, can you share screen and share a little bit what you did 
on the impact of I'm Omegas. And and I said five minutes, if it's seven or eight, it's okay, it's it's important. I think for this block altogether, we aim at, at having like 45 minutes. So we, we let's plan this uh, yeah until until four o'clock our time more or less. Paola. Sure, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Jan, for inviting me to participate in this meeting. That's my first time here, so I hope I can share some ideas and contribute to this uh, debate and uh, maybe inspire solutions in the maritime sector. Uh, so basically what we did in our study, I, I prepared a, a small presentation, but um, the sake of time, maybe it's better uh, for me to focus on uh, the changes uh, or the, the relative uh, differences from assumptions that we did in our study and uh, we observed that other studies uh, didn't. So it, is it possible for me to share my screen? Uh, because it's not allowed here. Okay, I then some, some of us needs to make you a presenter. So I think I just speak. made Paula present. Yes. Uh, okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, perfect. Yes. Thanks okay. so much. So um, basically, just uh, to understand the context of this impact assessment, we have first uh, conducted partial equilibrium analysis using gravity models uh, previously. And that's the first assessment that we use a general equilibrium model. We are, we are using the GTAP. Uh, we had some discussions at IMO about the methodology in, in, uh, during the expert workshop, uh, and we know the, the challenges and differences between the partial equilibrium methodology and the general equilibrium. We have conducted here uh, using general equilibrium models because we think it's important to understand second order effects. And when I mean second order effects, I'm saying that the measures that are already implemented and also in progress they change relative prices and we need to understand they change they change differently across commodities and bilateral trade flows and we need to understand uh, the, the economic consequences uh, and the social consequences of those changes so that's why we conducted here a uh, general equilibrium analysis using JTAP. one of the most important uh, differences between our study and the study conducted by the European Commission, for example, was the estimation of carbon emissions. So GTAP database, so this is it's what this slide is uh, talking. We have no information on carbon emissions from ships. So what we did, we estimate those uh, carbon emissions using a set of uh, data sets and the same strategy that we use uh, for, um, to project the transport demand in the fourth IMO GAG study. So I was one of the, the responsibles to conduct uh, the, uh, the projections and uh, David Hummels is also here that helped uh, during uh, this study. And what we did, we, we took the trade data uh, from UN Comtrade, which is inside GTEP. So we have those flows there. Uh, we those flows are the whole trade flows. So we use uh, data from uh, David's paper and also we updated their shares uh, of uh, trades transported by sea using machine learning techniques. So basically we, we try to understand what explained those uh, shares and we updated to, to the year of the GTAP. We associated every uh, commodity and bilateral trade flow to an average ship uh, to understand the, the emissions for each commodity and uh, origin and destination flow. Uh, we considered a shipping distance uh, based on the sea distance.org and doing that we were able to calculate shipping emissions using GTAP data. So our calculations uh, are about 90% of total emissions calculated by the fourth IMO GAG study. Uh, so in my opinion, this is one of the main differences between our study and other studies. So for example, as far as I understood, the European Commission study uh, used um, uh, 
uh, a conversion factor by origin destination. So conversion, so uh, every origin destination flow for all commodities is, uh, is the same emissions. So we did a more detailed work here in the emissions. So this is uh, what I believe explains part of our differences because when in our uh, impact assessment, we were assessing a carbon tax effect. So carbon tax is based on the emissions. So we model our shock uh, in the GTEP model, uh, the same as uh, in Lee's paper. And I talked to the technicians that uh, conducted the, the European Commission study, for example, they used the same idea. So that shouldn't explain uh, the difference in the results that we got. But what we are using as a baseline for CO2 emissions is very different. So that's why we got very different results. So this is, these are the mechanics of, of the shock, which we, we based on uh, this paper. And uh, our results, they are available in the IMO docs. I won't focus on that, but in my personal opinion, this is uh, the most important difference between uh, the, the assessments that uh, we perform in my research group and um, in other groups. And uh, I also believe that it's very important to have uh, the emissions very well cal calculated. So we are updating this emissions that I showed you by not using the average uh, ship by commodity and bilateral flow, but we are using now the whole distribution. So this is what we are doing now. So our, uh, our idea here is uh, to validate even more our emissions data uh, with the four uh, IMO GHG study. So we um, we have more accuracy to uh, assess uh, different carbon pricing mechanisms. So I think uh, that's the main idea that I, I would uh, like to um, tell the group. And again, I'm very happy to be here and to learn from you. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Paula. I hear a little bit of an echo, so I hope microphones are, are off. Um, excellent. Uh, I'm biting my tongue. I have questions and ideas, but we, we really want to move on. And I also want to give the floor to colleagues. I see one hand is raised, uh, which is Michele. Yes, very, very quickly, Jan, for those, those of us that do not remember, what is the actual difference in the, the main message difference between the UNCTAD study you present and the one that was just discussed? So, so what is the essence in terms of mm -hmm. substantial difference? Does that study say that uh, uh, developing countries have a large disadvantage out of these taxes? What, what is the message there? Good. Let me, let me go first and then Paola has the final and the right word. Uh, actually, when I heard, saw the studies and the outcomes and the impacts, I felt the basic message is similar, like which countries and which commodities and which distances are more affected than others, uh, shot in the same direction. For me, then, I was saying I was biting my tongue. Um, we entered the study, what is similar, we also used an effective distribution of um, of trade, of cases, whatever name you give it. We did not just take an, an average. Um, where, where was the difference with the previous one we did? It was about the short-term technical measures, which led to specific increases in costs and speeds, which were given to us by DNV. While Paola was looking at, and she will now correct and compliment me, at a hypothetical economic measure, which would be proportional to the emissions. That is why she actually looked at emission data, which I did not, we didn't have it. So Paola looked at emissions data and um, then had the costs proportional to the emissions because a carbon levy would be proportional. So Paola, please correct me or add to, to my answer to Michaela's very good question. That's right. Yeah, I would only uh, add some of the results. So basically, it's not the developing countries that will be uh, more harmed, 
But what we found in this simulation exercise of a carbon tax uh, is that the, the lower income countries would be mm -hmm. the most um, affected in economic terms. And so this is one of the main tables of the study. So we can see here the, the highlighted uh, regions that you uh, uh, suffer more or have um, a greater real GDP uh, impact. And we have also uh, 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 the summarized uh, results so about the effectiveness in reducing, reducing uh, emissions, about 7%, and also the global um, effects, uh, also on prices that we are able to assess using the GTAB. But uh, the, the origin of the studies is very different, and this is a simulation also study using a carbon pricing uh, mechanism. Right. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Paola. I see two more. Harry Laos. Paula, your hand is still up, but I think you just answered. Harry Laos, Harry Laos, please. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. I think Michele put a very nice question, and I think that the basic difference between the two studies is that they evaluated a different measure. I mean, your study evaluated the, the, the short term measure, which is the combined EXI SEMP CII. This is very different from a carbon tax. So I wouldn't be surprised that you get different results. I mean, I, I actually I would be surprised if you get the same, the <laughs> same result. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. if you evaluate two different things, you get two different results. So Yeah, cool. Yeah, and in terms of methodology, maybe then I can add one more question. And maybe also Ben Shepard, who is with us, who was leading our modeling. Um, we were, when we started out, our colleagues in the trade division gave us also different options of data sets and industries. And we went for the one that allowed for the highest number of countries to be covered, even if this had some other disadvantages in terms of level of detail of, of commodities or, or other things. And I believe, Paula, your data set in terms of countries, or in some cases you had regions rather than countries. So you have a slightly smaller number of units and region country pairs than we had. Um, but the question would be whether this difference would have um, any impact systematic bias towards stronger or weaker impacts or more one country than the other, or whether this is, yeah, I, I don't know, Paula, I would ask you that question. <laughs> Sure, just a, a quick reaction to Harold uh comment. Uh, that's why I focus on uh, the comparison of our study with the European Commission study, which in my opinion is the most similar to ours. Uh, so we have uh, 141 countries slash regions. Mm -hmm. So of, of course, bigger countries are uh, a region itself, uh, but others are aggregated. Uh, that wouldn't affect uh, the results, of course, the global results are weighted by the relevance of those uh, countries, regions. Uh, but we know that, for example, and I'm, I watched a presentation, uh, all, all those models, they are based on uh, input output tables uh, of the countries. And uh, we know that uh, for those global uh, models, and I, if there is an expert here that can correct me, that's not my, my expertise area. But we know that about uh, 100 countries, they have good input output tables. So I heard that in a presentation we had here at the university from uh, Joaquin Guilloto, which is one of um, one important researcher on input output. And so some of those uh, countries and regions, they estimate the input output table based on the regions nearby. So this is this is one of um, uh, one limitation uh, of those studies. But he assured me that uh, those 100 countries that had uh, good input output tables, they represent uh, more than 95 percent of uh, the global economic uh, flows. So uh, of course to have uh, um, an accurate response for very small countries and for regions that are estimated uh, might not be very accurate, but on average, 
might be a good answer. So I would I would say that, and if there is an expert here that can help me in complement this, uh, uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. Yes, and I saw one expert just raised his hand. Ben, <laughs> you are muted. Muted as usual. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say very quickly that actually my, my take on the difference in results is a little bit similar to the speakers just before me. I think we find a pretty similar story. Um, I don't think anyone, I, I'm a modeler, I don't think anyone should believe modeling results uh, down to the last dollar or down to the third decimal place. The idea is to give you a general sense of the way in which the data plays out given a, a set of um, the theoretical assumptions that we're using are very different between um, the model that Paolo just presented and the one uh, that we did with UNCTAD. Um, but I think the thing that I would concentrate on, I, I think if, if we want to have a coherent story uh, that we're telling the outside world, the thing that we really want to agree on is the inputs, um, because we're all going through the same process. That is to say, looking at a policy change, translating it into changes in transport costs, and then changing those uh, changes in transport costs into changes in trade and GDP. <coughs> and the last part is a technical part. You won't get trade experts to agree on exactly how that should be done. Everybody's got their different way of doing it. But if we can agree on the first part, my suspicion is that we'll actually get pretty close uh, right at the end. And I think that would be a very useful thing from a policy perspective. Thanks a lot, Shepard, uh, Ben, also from for connecting uh, with other commitments in parallel. Uh, I see Gabriela, you have raised your hand and thereafter Ronald, and then Ronald, you will have in any case soon have the floor. Gabriela, second attempt. I think that's a legacy hand, uh, Jan. No, I had uh, lowered her hand. Oh, okay. I had lowered Gabriela's hand. It was not a legacy hand, but. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? And now we can hear you. Yes, this is a question for Paula. Is um, from the countries that you include, uh, how many of those countries are developing countries and they have um, uh, input output tables? And also, uh, what percentage of the? No, this is you have industry. Yes, yeah, so, okay. Let's focus on that. How many developing countries do you include in your analysis that have input output data? Paula, very quickly to that specific question. Um, I have no, I have no numbers uh, to tell you, Gabriela, now, but I can raise them and uh, answer in a few minutes if yeah. you guys give me some time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I again also remind everybody we are sharing the material we have, and I think Paula your studies among them in the Dropbox folder. And if some things are missing, we will fill this up over the next few days. So material presented here or not presented here, really that's a brainstorming that came out of a different email streams, previous meetings. So we will share for these very specific questions. Uh, Ronald, your hand is up. Yes, thank you, Jan, and thank you, Paula, for presenting this very interesting modeling work. Uh, my question builds on what Ben um, has mentioned with regard to inputs and assumptions that have been used to model the uh, measures, particularly on the impacts of the carbon tax. Um, I wonder if what you did was to calculate the total uh, increase in transport costs due to carbon, carbon tax and um, add it up to the CIF uh, and divide by fault value of of the transport margin. Um, and I'm asking that because we know that the carbon tax is uh, in the measurement unit of US dollar per ton of emissions. So does that mean you convert first the uh, the trade values um, between countries into um, carbon emissions, and then you can calculate the total Costs uh, changes based on based on that, or did you uh, convert first the trade value into into tons and then compute the activities and and then compute the emissions? Can, can I just emissions? just come in there? Uh, because Ben was relying on our input, and the input he got from us was an ad valorem change in trade cost. And and for this short term, as Harry Laos described it quite well. 
we were not at all looking at emissions. Emissions did not appear in our study. We looked at CII and EXI and different measures and the input that we used, and you were actually part of some of the case studies <laughs> about which Gabriela asked. Uh, so uh, you remember we really looked only at, okay, if due to an IMO technical measure, operational measure, the speed of the ships goes up by 4.6%, and the voyage costs go up by 5.8% or something. Uh, what, and then if this ship that has this impact on speed and cost carries that cargo and that cargo at this value, then the value, the CIF value will change its cost by 2.8%. And this minus 2.8% was the import for Ben. So Ben got from us 130,000 times um, per country pair and commodity group, a change in the ad valorem. So th that's, uh, it, it, but the question is very important for all of us because for the next round of comprehensive impact assessment, we will need to do a combination of both. We will need to look at some technical impacts that will result into some ad valorem change in trade costs like we did at Antat, but also uh, assuming that carbon taxes work and are per CO2 or something, more like what Paola did, like starting from the emissions and then go to the trade costs. But uh, the question you asked Ben, I came in, in, if Ben wants to add, please add, but I, I hope I have answered on behalf of Ben. I see Ben is agreeing because who is silent agrees. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm asking the question to Paula. I was just saying building on what Ben has said with regard to the input. Oh, <laughs> so good, building on what Ben said, good. So, so Paula, one sorry, quick Ben's answer before clear. I before no I can give no the floor problem. again to, yeah. I want to give the floor again to Ronald afterwards because Ronald also has done some assessment and he will share them then. <laughs> Paula, you have the floor. Sure, but uh, of course, what you said uh, also highlighted what we did. So we calculated the emissions from the the sea trade flows in GTAB. So it's very specific about the data we have, and then we using so the 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 mechanisms that we use is the same of this paper. So exactly the same, and they assess a carbon tax on only on uh, container shipping, but we did that for all shipping. So it's basically the same they they uh, explain in the paper. But as uh, Ian said, we had the emissions, and then we calculate the uh, the uh, for a carbon tax of that emissions in, in value terms of 2014, which is the GTEP version 10. What's the participation in total um, transport margins costs? So this is what we did, a relative change. So that's uh, what's, why it's different and it's important. Uh, this is a very important issue to understand the differences between the studies and how we can, you know, um, uh, contribute from now on with what we did and with what uh, UNCTAD did. And also this procedure was the same used by the European Commission study, which is the most similar to ours. So they use the same that we, we had a, a meeting with the, the, the experts. It was the same procedure. Right, just, just to give a comment to that, or you want to? Yeah, no, no, I wanted to give you the floor on that now. Anyhow, why, why don't you continue? Because you are the next on my list of, of speakers, so you you can share results from the work you have done and and happily link it to the other two studies that were presented so far. So, Ronald, shoot ahead. Yes, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful opportunity, uh, Jan, and thank you. I'm happy to be here to be able to uh, present some of the work that EMC has independently done in the space of um, assessing the impact of decarbonization measures on in shipping on on states um, just to give you a bit of a, a background this is the scenario that we modeled um, independently we had uh, some assignments to carry out in impact assessment work particularly to assess the impact of a combination of technical and economic measures 
but we took the liberty to also experiment on our own to be able to provide a timely contribution to the discussion of impact assessments. So to give you a brief description of the scenario we experimented, the baseline scenario takes into account the short-term measures that are adopted at the IMO, which includes um, CII standard, which uh, will be tightened uh, gradually from 2027 until 2030. And we also take into account, for example, the projection of uh, trade, international trade from various uh, um, leading economic uh, organizations. Um, and we use also the RCP for those who do not know what RCP is, Representative Concentration Pathways 2.6. This is the IPCC scenario that also provides some sort of a guideline when it comes to um, how soon the whole uh, sectors uh, will need to decarbonize to reach uh, more or less the Paris Agreement goals. Um, so that's the baseline with this uh, trade projection. And then we simulate a policy scenario. In this example, we simulate a very specific policy scenario, which is a combination of uh, technical measure that is global fuel standard. So that is roughly, it's basically what is being discussed at the IMO as well as one of the most ambitious proposals together with a carbon levy, uh, where we assume that by 2040, there will be a reduction of 82% well to wake greenhouse gas emissions. So this is also very similar to the target that has been recently adopted at the IMO. And for carbon levy, uh, we apply an increasing rate of from 50 US dollar uh, from before 2030, maybe assuming that 2027 will be the year where this will be adopted and applied. And it will go up to 150 US dollar by 2030 and up to 200 US dollar from 2030 until 2050. And in addition to policy scenario, we also simulated uh, a scenario where there is a re revenue recycling. So all the revenues that come or are generated from um, the economic measure, in this case, carbon levy, they are collected and then fully allocated to mitigate impacts. Uh, the way we simulate this is we allocate 50% of the revenues that are uh, generated to SITs and LDCs and another 50% for developing countries other than SITs and LDCs. And most of these revenues will be to mitigate the losses from the increase in transport costs, and they are distributed in the form of state aid, improvement in port infrastructure, or investment in zero carbon uh, shipping infrastructure until 2050. So a little bit of the framework, modeling framework that we use, so similar to UNCTAD, um, we are specialized in analyzing the economic impacts of the measures and not the necessarily the technical uh, impacts of, of the measures. So we have to work with various experts um, to be able to carry out this assessment. So we combine three different models, as you can see here, a fleet model that is hosted and developed by, by MERS called Navigate, where we test the impact of the global fuel standard and the carbon levy on fleet side, particularly analyzing how these measures will increase the total cost of ownership, which include the capital expenditure and op operational expenditure of, of the ship for each ship type. And we at EMC take this output um, as an input for our model to assess how the transport costs on the trade route level will be impacted, where uh, the, sh the increase in total ownership of, of uh, adopting new technologies because of the, uh, for example, the application of global fuel standard, where, for example, new ship will need to transition to hydrogen based fuels, more expensive types of fuels and applying technical measures to reduce emissions. All of these um, impacts that will result in increase in, in total cost of ownership, they're taken into account and calculated for each bilateral, bilateral trade routes that are covered in our model. And on top of that, we also assess the impact of this change in 
in shipping costs and trade costs uh, on maritime model share because obviously when there is a, an increase in transport costs, this will impact maritime model share. Um, the uh, impact can vary depending on the composition of this transport costs uh, in proportion to the total logistics costs or what what Jan also mentioned as trade costs across the routes. And then we use these inputs, basically, these outputs, sorry, as input for the macroeconomic uh, model, which is a, a also an, a computable general equilibrium model uh, that is hosted by Jam E3 to assess the, the uh, indicators such as trade flows, GDP, or the outputs of different sectors. And we also carry out specific assessment on selected case studies at the on a on the state level to allow to zoom in in a detailed um, uh, cases or aspects of of the of the impact, including testing also the 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 impact of applying or deploying mitigation measures such as revenue recycling. So straight to the results, uh, we first look into transport costs by 2030. Uh, the top graph, the top map, gives you uh, an overview of the impact without revenue recycling by 2030. Um, in this scenario, the policy scenario, we see that the increase in transport costs uh, or the shipping costs, sorry, not yet in the, the bilateral transport route, is the highest because this is the moment where a lot of investment for infrastructure will need to be done to decarbonize the sector. Uh, the development of zero carbon uh, fuel uh, supply chain systems, for example, that will uh, incur the biggest costs, biggest capital costs for ship operators and ship owners. And then we translate that into bilateral trade routes. Um, and in this graph, we uh, present it from, from the export side. As we can see here, uh, there are some countries that will see quite a dramatic uh, increase in transport costs up to 35 to 41 percent, but uh, the the increased range in transport costs can vary from 10 percent until until 41 percent. Um, with some countries seeing very uh, big impacts, such as Canada in this case, uh, also Russia, and some other countries in in the Middle East and Southeast Asia. Um, when revenue recycling is implemented, we we can immediately also see mitigation effect for countries such as Canada uh, that moves from, from a bracket uh, up from the uh, impact that they see from 30 to 35% up to 25 to 30% range. Um, next, we also look at the impact on export values. This is by 2050, just to give you more of the um, exciting results uh, by, at the end of the uh, timeline of the target and what we see here uh, without revenue recycling the impact of uh, both combination of measures will uh, potentially reduce export values to some countries up to five percent by 2050 and uh, with revenue recycling we see that most of the uh, reduction in, in export values will be relatively small. That is within the range of zero till, till 2%. And we also see that there is a major positive impact for uh, export of commodities in the African countries here, um, especially in the uh, West and also Central, towards also the, the Southern African countries. Uh, they will see uh, positive impacts, which is a reversal from negative to positive impacts because of the application of the uh, revenue recycling. Um, but we also note here that apparently the application of revenue recycling will affect the competitive position of countries in, in their export. Um, and this uh, also then uh, leads to a conclusion that depending on how the revenues can be distributed, the alleviation of negative impact could be Unit more uniform uh, among countries, or they could also show some heterogeneity uh, depending on on the mechanisms that will be deployed to 
to allow revenue to be distributed among, among impacted countries. Lastly, this slide is about the GDP impact for different country groupings. Uh, the DE is developing and emerging com economies, OD is other developing countries, and LDCs and SITs, as Jan has mentioned. Uh, what we can see here, without revenue recycling, um, most countries will see um, from slight to moderate impacts, especially for DE, but we can see that the negative impacts in terms of GDP uh, for these two groupings will not exceed 0.5%. And for SITS and LDC, this is a little bit of a different situation because we see that a reduction in GDP of almost uh, minus 0.8% by 2030, where the impact is felt the most and it will be slowly mitigated and uh, or it will slowly or gradually decline until 2050. But with revenue recycling, so moving to our to, to the right graph, what we see here because of the allocation of the revenues, most countries will see very slight um, impacts in their GDP and SITs and LDCs will see a dramatic also change or reversal of impacts from negative impacts to uh, positive impact, uh, which uh, includes an increase in GDP up to, to 3%. Um, just to give you a disclaimer that the model again aggregates several countries, um, even including also countries in uh, SIDS and LDCs. So the accuracy of, of the impacts seen by, by these countries will need to be refined by disaggregating them further. Uh, some countries in developing countries also are aggregated, and that's, I think, where also uh, a refinement can be can be made to uh, uh, better uh, assess the impact in a more accurate way. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, I tried my best to keep it within five minutes, but thank you very much for listening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Ronald. Uh, a um, big reminder to, for the third agenda item where we discuss the, the scope of this type of assessment, like uh, should we include the impact on climate change? Should we look at the impact also on potential providers of future alternative fuels and or what you did, the impact of the use of revenues that uh, would be generated by an economic measure, which I found very, very interesting. And when I saw your draft study, that's why I invited you to share this here. So thank, thank you very much, Ronald. Uh, Paula, you have a question. Thank you. Thank you, Ronald, for the presentation. It's a very important um, mechanism to be assessed. Uh, I was just wondering, it's very important to understand what are the rebound effects of revenue recycling mechanisms. So uh, did you look at that? Because uh, at the end of the day, we need to understand which measures or which policies that we are assessing are the most cost effective to reduce emissions, right? So when you come back with that money, for example, what has happened with emissions? So, did you plan to do that, or did you do some assessment on that? Uh, thank you for the question, Paula. So, we ideally would like to do an iterative uh, study on 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 the impact of these um, mitigation uh, measures, including revenue recycling, and if the rebound effect that you are referring to refers to whether uh, the uh, uh, reversal of the negative impact will also bring about increase in emission. We haven't actually uh, completed the, the iteration to test and, and see if activities or international trade volume will increase again because of the uh, the revenue uh, recycling. Um, so that's, that's a, a very good question, but ideally because of the global fuel standard measure that that also uh, has a, a, a property which limits, I think, the the carbon intensity of of the fuels that are used 
this will present that, prevent that rebound effect to to take place um, because of again yeah, the the necessity to comply to uh, the uh, set standard in terms of emissions. Cool. Paula, you want to respond directly, and then I see Gavin raised his hand, but maybe Paula, if you want to respond directly. Um, no, actually, it's not a response. It's just a, a quick thought that I, I would like to share with the group, because yeah. uh, I work with impact evaluation for some time, and uh, in the simulations I, I do normally, I like to, uh, to propose uh, uh, tax and subsidies um, approaches, you know, that they are more revenue neutral, so we can change the incentives without distort, uh, without thinking about how possible distortions from revenue recycling. So it's just a quick thought that uh, <laughs> I want to share with the group that uh, normally I think about when I am, um, you know, uh, addressing impact evaluations. So I, I don't know if that makes sense for you, but uh, yeah. this is something no, no, that thanks. I, I thanks think a lot. Uh, it's definitely among the things we want to discuss also later on towards the end, like what the scope and, and how to go about. Uh, Gavin, you raised your hand. You're muted. Yeah. No, yes, you're I'm, I am. Yeah. No, I don't, I, I don't want to derail anything here. So I'm just checking. Is this a time to discuss the sort of underlying assumptions that that were taken on in these studies, or should I wait for later to do it? Um, I, I would prefer to keep this for later, if you don't mind. Ah, right okay. now, we, we I want to go through what has been done to to complete okay. that brainstorming. If there are specific technical questions about There's clarity, uh, uh, but I, I I can guess what you are heading at, and uh, please come in later. Don't forget ah, what okay. you want to say. Okay. Um, <laughs> there is one. There is one question. Yeah, please. Overall, um, I, I I've read through the the uh, the the UGTAD, uh, approach, and there was the adoption of a very static approach. There wasn't any changes in activity. I'm just wondering if that is across all of the studies here. Was a uh, it, it was taking a snapshot of the existing paradigm, the existing behavior, and not uh, making any changes to those. No, I think that's a valid general question, and, and my take is, it is um, it is static. I think all our models are, are making assumptions, um, like you take a photo of the current trade system, all these black boxes in the models assume elasticities based on past estimates. Uh, I mean, colleagues may may correct me, but. But that's exactly the type of question. Once we look beyond like the next five years, next 10, next 25 years, I, we had this discussion also with uh, Khalid, who is with us here, who was helping us with this recent work and like a lot of but and additional, all the additional things we, we would consider as much as possible in more longer term assessment. So let's come back to this later. And I just saw one more hand was up. Gabriela, you gave it a second try to raise your hand. Uh, yes, so there was, uh, again, uh, what is it to run now? Um, well, why did you aggregate this, uh, in this estimate? Why did you have to, why don't you show this, uh, the result? Because, you know, what do we learn by having these aggregations, you know? So how do you implement policies? We, we don't know how developing countries would react, what kind of product, what region, destination. Is this a so question to our... Why are you having an aggregation of the data? You know, that maybe that's also for the, for, yeah, but maybe, yeah. Was this a question to, to Ronald? To Ronald, to Ronald yes. I'm, to Ronald if Ronald, Ronald you... understood the question, please shoot ahead. I'll try. Um, if the question is why uh, did we aggregate, um, I think you might be referring to my last slide, which aggregated several countries, um, not several countries, essentially all the countries that we analyzed into three different groupings. And that's just to to help um, see a common pattern uh, across all these three, uh, across different country groupings, so to speak, for, for example, emerging economies that we see that the, the impact, they are not uh, as, as strong as uh, 
um, in in OD other developing countries. Uh, so the big developing countries they are not necessarily impacted as strongly as the other developing countries, uh, which are typically consisting of lower uh, income countries. And then we have also SIDS and LDCs that are mostly uh, more impacted of these uh, from these policy measures. Uh, when and if your question also pertains to uh, why we did not disaggregate this uh, further, we uh, um, could only go down to the level of detail that also was uh, included or covered by by the by the GTAP model. And sometimes there is a, a decision that has to be made with regard to uh, computational tractability and data availability, uh, because where we when the countries are disaggregated further computation time will will increase further along with also data requirements. Um, so that was also a bit of a limitation in our study that we had to aggregate some of the, the countries, uh, such as uh, some of the SITs will need to be aggregated into Oceania, uh, but um, disaggregating them further when needed can be can be valuable for uh, the discussion. Yeah, yeah, I guess it is a general common for all the studies, you know, so because uh, when we want to implement policy, how do we advise one country or the other, right? So uh, this is a general question for the speakers, perhaps, you know, for policy implementation. How, how, what do we recommend to the countries? Yeah. To the countries and the product they are supposed to... Yeah. to no, take. if I can come in, the, it's a valid point. Uh, and, and as I said, when we did our study, we chose one methodology over another because it did allow us for a large number of individual countries, because individual mm. countries, negotiators, members of the IMO want to know what does this mean for me? At the same time, I want to reiterate what Ben said later on. There are so many assumptions there, there's always some error. And for me, it is important that there's no systematic error. There's no bias. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but if the results for an individual trade route or commodity or country, there is always a margin of, of error. And the more you aggregate, the more confident can you be, okay, that's the right direction. So, but it's a useful trade-off. And I think Ronald, you responded well, since like to some extent, that's, that's the level of aggregation where you feel comfortable. And the, if you were to disaggregate more, it would be more interesting for individual countries, but there's also more of a risk there's some random variation which does not have a causality, which then leads to policy conclusions which are just caused by random, by, by well, coincidence, no? Yeah, well, that depends on the method you use, right? Because uh, we can, yeah, okay. So I don't want to discuss the, the extended yeah. time, but, uh, you know, we cannot rely on aggregation because, uh, because we want to reduce errors. I mean, the aggregation also will lead you to big errors, you know? Because you're trying to generalize results, and uh, that that can lead you to a big, big measure of errors, right? So, so it goes yeah, well, one has to be very careful. <laughs> use, right? so, no one, of course, one has to be very careful how to interpret the results in the end. Exactly. Like if if there's a country group that has, on average, this or that impact, that does not right. mean that every individual country in that mm -hmm. group has the same effect. I think, I, I hope we we all are aware of this. Good. Yeah, we we are um, have very very interesting discussion, but time flies. We still have one more study that was undertaken by Pierre and co-authors, uh, which I would now like Pierre Cariou to invite to share. I think you have been made present and can share your screen. Pierre, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can you see my my screen? Not yet. Yes, now we can see yes. your screen. All right. If you make it full screen, then we see the full. All right. Better this way. Yeah. Thanks. All right. So thanks, um, thanks, Jan, and uh, hi to uh, all of us. And I'm very happy to share this uh, this study. But actually, to give you a little background, I started two years ago when I started my sabbatical at uh, at Cornell. That's why you have a co-author from a Cornell, and I was actually doing my uh, sabbatical at the uh, Agricultural Economics Department but explains the focus also on, uh, on grain and uh, soya beans. Uh, and I did this study together with uh, Ronald from AEMC, just presented before, so I'm sure he would have been uh, able to make the presentation too. 
so I will go quickly through the main rational to the study, the main findings, and some uh, some conclusions. Uh, so what was the rational? Is the rational actually was two years ago? It's just when the DNV that study was uh, released, and what I one element I get from the study was to say that the uh, impact of uh, environmental uh, policies, maritime policies, uh, will depend a lot about the reaction of ship owners. It was pretty clear. And uh, this reaction is not only, but it's also uh, to a large extent explained by the sensitivity of trade or transport quantities to uh, a transit time and cost. And in the Oakland study uh, that uh, Jan presented earlier, uh, you aggregated these two elements into the total logistical uh, cost, all right? And this is what I found uh, often neglected in analysis. Uh, although the elasticity, both to time and cost, can be pretty uh, high for some markets, and uh, in particular for agricultural markets. When you look at the UNCTAD study, it uh, was only about short-term measure, but for instance, in the extreme case, uh, for an average increase of 10% of uh, maritime uh, trade cost, uh, it could lead to significant uh, decrease in uh, agricultural trade, food and beverage. So that was the idea and the rationale was were there to say, try to, um, to set up a model that could help us to go a little further about this and to use available data. So it's really more an empirical study that we uh, carry on applied to the grain and soybean market, agricultural trade, because once again, in the UNCTAD study, there was not these details. In the UNCTAD study, it was bulk agriculture and uh, food process. And here I wanted to go into two specific markets and to try to see if it's possible to do a, a modeling and empirical study to understand uh, how sensitive is trade to my time trade cost and, and transit time. And this is in using uh, augmented gravity models for my grain and soybeans. Uh, and then the second part, which is more novel, I would say, was to try then to understand how these elasticities influence the choice of ship owners. Looking at the profit function of a ship owners, how a ship owner might change his decision on the optimal speed and what would be the impact for trade and emission according to the level of elasticities. The last part was also to try to test how the level of taxation may or not change this optimal uh, solution. So to, to go to the main findings, my, my first point was to say, can we measure uh, the elasticity of trade in volume for soybeans and uh, grain uh, compared to time and cost? So we, we put together with uh, Ronald and my colleague from Cornell, uh, classical, I would say, augmented gravity models, where, and this is what you have in, in, uh, in red, we were able to capture the fact to say, if I look at the first column uh, for a grain, would be to say a 10% increase in time for a grain exports uh, would decrease uh, the trade by 9.1%. 10% increase in transit time lead to something around 9% decrease in uh, transit time. And for cost, 10% increase in, in my time transport cost would lead to something like 7%. So this was the first part of the study to try to find a, a, a model standard, but that could be used to shipping and that could give the possibility to go into more details about very specific uh, commodities. The second part was to try to understand, uh, and we do, did both some simulation, but more some general uh, illustrative cases about how this is going to change the ship owner's uh, decision, especially on the speed, because we could see that one of the main rational uh, from implementing taxes is mostly about the fact to say that if you don't consider for time or cost uh, elasticity, which means you would be in point number A on my graph, then the rational is easy. You're going to put a tax. If you put a tax, automatically the profit function is going to decrease and the ship owners, they're going to reduce the speed from A to B. But what, that, what does it change? It, now you consider that the trade could be sensitive time and cost. And we show, just show that there was a sensitivity. But in the shape, it will be totally different. You see, we would be in a position where the profit function will look more like the red uh, curve, which means two implications. The starting point is not the same. When we, you have trade which are highly sensitive to time, it means that very likely, which makes sense, ship owners will go at a faster speed 
because they know if they reduce too much, they're going to lose trade. OK, but once again, the tax will also induce a reduction in, in, in speed, but less than what was expected before. So this is about time. Now, when you also factor in that there is an elasticity of trade to cost, this is a curve I presented as an illustrative uh, example. So we took some exo uh, illustrative examples. OK, uh, you could see once again that those curves are going to have a very different shape. First of all, the curve are not going to be the same if you consider that the trade is elastic, but with a low elasticity to uh, cost, or if you consider that there is a huge elasticity. You can see that then the curve is not going to be the same. And if you introduce a tax, you may have also different uh, situation when the ship owners, they decide to pass through the tax to the final customer, or if they decided to keep the tax for themselves. And there is also even some situation, which is a situation here, for instance, which is to say that for uh, US export of grain for a level of taxation of 150 US dollar, it might make sense sometimes for ship owners to continue to pay the tax than to transfer to the final consumer if we assume that this is going to induce a, a large reduction in trade. So this is what we did, and this is what we did through simulation for the different uh, type of market with different level of taxation, uh, with different different uh, trade characteristics. And I would say this is our, our main conclusion. Our main conclusion, which was not uh, intuitive, I would say I was not expecting that when I started the, the study, is more or less uh, sum up here. You can look at the grain export for uh, United States, the largest exporters. The, the main takeaway is as follows, is to say, if you implement a tax, but the level of tax is pretty low, okay, it means that the ship owners they may have interest not to pass through uh, the tax to the final consumer because then it will impact the trade. They would reduce largely the trade. So they may have, if the tax is too little, interest to continue to to pay the tax themselves, not to transfer to consumers. Which means what? It means that the policy actually will have a quite a limited effect. Because it means what they will keep the tax for themselves, they will probably not reduce the speed and the emission. And this is what we have here. The level of emission will remain more or less the same, especially if you consider that they want to carry the same amount of trade. Now there is a point, and it might depend on each market, each type of market, where if you have a high level of taxation, then the ship owner is not going to continue to pay the tax, is going to transfer that to the uh, uh, a final consumer and it's going to reduce largely the speed. And here you could have a large effect from the tax. So to, to sum up, and I hope I haven't been too long, uh, Jan, uh, three main things. When trade is not sensitive to time and cost, and there are many markets like that, we can, I would say, expect a positive impact from a tax, which means the standard idea of the ship owners will pass through the tax because the elasticity to cost or my time cost is limited and they will reduce the speed is going to work. No problem. Now, if you go into a situation where the trade for trade is sensitive to time and to cost, and if when the tax, if we decide on a tax which is very low for soya beans and grain was around 100 US dollar per ton of fuel, it means that the ship owners, then they may have an interest in continuing to pay the tax, not reducing the speed, which means the impact in terms of emission on the market might be very uh, limited or limited. Obviously, but the last conclusion is to say, if you have with trade which are sensitive to time and costs, you have to get a tax which is pretty high for a study it was more than 100 US dollar, okay? So that the ship owner may have an interest in passing the, the tax because it's too expensive for them to pay by themselves, but also they will have an incentive to reduce the speed. And this is where you can find the largest, obviously, impact and omission on emissions, sorry, and on trade. What is interesting in doing that also is that as you have a large impact or you may have large impact, then you have enough incentives to trigger a change in technology. I'm thinking about here when the ship owners, they can't afford to, to continue with the compliant costs, so they might really invest in new propulsion of fuel. But also when you think about the speed, this is where on this market, where they have interest also to maybe to implement new routing solution, green propulsion or assistance, which is actually a way to keep the speed at the same level. OK, even if you have a tax, which means it's a way and this is a way I could look at it now uh, to say that solution like green assistance can be very good, actually, because they can keep the market condition without burning more fuel. 
and there is, is a tax is high, some incentive for companies to do that. So this is a, the main intake, maybe to do a little teasing. The next is a paper I will present in uh, 10 days at Long Beach, the International Association of Maritime Economists. And this time we did something a little different, but this time not only to uh, soya bean and grain, but we applied to 19 different agricultural trade and more, hundred, more than 150 countries to once again try to assess the level of, of taxation that will be dependent on the level of elasticity to cost uh, and trade. The paper is also with uh, Ronald, but also with my co-author that couldn't be with us today, which is Brad uh, Ricard from uh, from Corner. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Pierre. Um, very nice complimenting and again highlighting the that often the impact is above all through the impact on speed right? because the, mm. the ship owners decisions are very much initially and strongly on speed and at least in our assessment when we really looked at every different trade and and we had to calculate ad valorem impact mm. for most trades the impact through the speed impact was bigger than the impact through actual shipping cost impact but we don't know if it will be the same for for economic measures uh, we have only one hour left um, but i really appreciate i think it was very important we still have two more agenda items we still want to learn what are the plans at the imo then we still want time for discussion but i have two questions so i will close the question list now michele first and then paula and then i will give the floor to camille and id from the imo yeah, th thank you, Jan, and thank you, Pierre. I will attend your presentation uh, in Los Angeles. My question is, uh, uh, you are identifying this uh, responsive, these adaptive responses on how much the tax is passed on by the mm -hmm. ship owners, and I think that's very interesting. In another paper uh, that, that I co-authored, we observed that depending on the market conditions. So I was wondering, in, in your analysis, uh, uh, are you considering uh, constant market conditions? Because I imagine for some of these commodities, prices can fluctuate very much, while the cost that the ship owners have to endure might not be fluctuating as much, which means that in reality, your, your threshold might depend very much on what actually is the price I can get on the market, independently on whether there is a high or a low carbon tax. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's a very... Um, yeah, wait, let's, okay. let's give uh, Paula's Sorry. question and then Pierre, yeah. you will answer the two questions together. Paula, your question to Pierre. Thank you. I promise I'll be quick. <laughs> so it's a very nice paper. I also enjoyed reading when uh, Ronald shared in our group. I was, uh, when I read it, I was in doubt on um, what costs have you included in the, in the assessment, in the simulations, if it was only fuel consumption costs, uh, because in when talking uh, with uh, engineers, they always tell me that there are, for example, additional routines and inspections that must be done in the main engine. Uh, when you reduce uh, speed, and that might in also impact operational costs. Um, and also you have, for example, additional uh, capex, capital costs for uh, increasing uh, the fleet to attend uh, deadlines. So if you don't, if you uh, consider like doing that in this uh, version of, that you are uh, assessing more uh, countries and more uh, products. Thank you. Mm. Uh, these are two very valid uh, points. I mean, in general, it's about, uh, I would say in general, it's about modeling. You have to take some assumption and indeed, uh, sometimes you have to leave aside some and to make some big assumption. And indeed, uh, uh, the change in price in freight rate, as Michele mentioned, or the real change in cost might be depending on the market and so on, are definitely so uh, something to consider. What we did is more or less 10% increase, 20% increase in cost compared to what it was before, but it was in the fuel cost. But indeed, if you want to go, as I mentioned now, you know, to go into assessing different technology, then you will need to, to implement the, the CapEx, all these kind of uh, solutions. So I cannot, I mean, say nothing against what you mentioned. Indeed, it should be done. Now, is it the priority? I think it's what Jan wants to initiate now. What should be the priority? It's in, in line with the question we had before. Why to look at the developing country level and not at each individual country? I would say because there's a lot of discussion at IMO 
about how oh, developing countries are going to be, uh, you know, impacted and, and not. And if we can help to say, yes, it's true. No, it's not true. Even if we don't have the exact numbers, uh, that, that can help. But I agree with you. Then the paper could be turning. Usually what we try to do, which is for me was, I was at Cornell. I was working on agricultural trade. Cornell might not be interesting in shipping, but very interesting in agricultural trade. So this is a level of aggre aggregation uh, are targeted. But, Cool. Thank you all very much. We have to move on. Before I move on to agenda item number two and uh, Camille and I did two quick comments. As we are running out of time um, and we have so many amazing colleagues and brains and experts here, please also feel free to, um, to put comments, questions, links, suggestions in the chat. This is recorded, including the, the chats. Uh, so that we don't use this opportunity. And secondly, uh, I've put again the links to the Dropbox uh, folders, both the one from 2020 and also this one. I have received some requests um, for some of you to join the Dropbox folder. This would mean that you could edit the Dropbox folder. Now, this does not mean that I don't trust you, but having 52 colleagues uh, editing a Dropbox folder is a little bit risky. <laughs> So I prefer you send me anything you want to be included. <laughs> um, and and then we we don't open the Dropbox for, for editing. Otherwise, the Dropbox folders are read only and I it should work. I mean, I've many people have used to downloaded it. If there is still somebody who cannot even read the Dropbox folders, let us know. We we have normally we work with SharePoint here or OneDrive, but that is more difficult just fair outside the United Nations system. It's our internal control. So I, I hope it works. So these two points, we will continue to share ideas, questions, input, the presentations. I hope Pierre, um, Ronald, um, and yeah, you, Paula, you will share, if you don't mind, your PowerPoints. We will put them in the Dropbox for us. And feel free to bombard each other with questions, comments also in the chat. Having said this, uh, Camille and ID. What will the IMO do and what do you want us and others to do? <laughs> um, I tried this one. Hi, Jan. Um, hi, Kavi. Hi, everyone. Uh, greetings from London. Um, I hope you can hear me well. If you can just put your thumbs up. Thumbs up. Yeah, fine. Thanks. Um, so many thanks, uh, Jan. Many thanks, UNCTAD colleagues, for uh, organizing this, uh, this informal dialogue. Uh, at the end of this uh, this uh, summer, which will remain as a as a glorious summer for for IMO, uh, it started with the adoption of the of the 2023 strategy, which we are uh, very proud of. Um, I see many familiar faces. Uh, I would like to to thank you all uh, for for your efforts. Really, uh, the efforts for supporting the. Uh, government at IMO in uh, in adopting these uh, these regulations that are needed. It's a it's a complex task, and we need uh, uh, the the collaborative efforts of all. Um, I think it's really encouraging to see the uh, the increasing interest in the research community, in particular, uh, for this issue of the uh, impacts of um, of uh, shipping decarbonization measures. Um, uh, but I, I'd like just to note that it, the impact assessment uh, is also intrinsically linked to uh, to the policy making uh, at IMO. So it, this task has some specificities which are inherent to the, the nature of this of, of this work in terms of the scope, in terms of the um, oversight of the work, in terms of recommendations that we expect from from this impact assessment. Um, and I will I will now. Um, uh, dive into this, um, if you don't mind, and maybe a little bit longer than what I initially hoped. Uh, so it may be more than five minutes. Uh, but so stop me if, if it's too long. But I, I'll, I'll do my best. I have ten ten slides. Let me let me share my screen. Okay. Great. Let me just put the slideshow. Should be easier for everyone. OK, good. Um, let me just start very quickly by by reminding what we have 
uh, what the IMO member states have agreed in the strategy in, in July, because this is really the basis for, for the, the next, uh, the work that's, that's, uh, that is starting now on the impact assessment. Um, we have an updated vision. We have importantly updated levels of ambition, in particular, uh, the ambition to, to reach uh, net zero GHG emissions from international shipping um, close to 2050. Um, the targets that have been uh, upgraded take into account the well-to-wake emissions of marine fuels. Um, we also have increased levels of ambition for uh, 2030, uh, looking in particular at the uh, energy used by international shipping. Um, and it covers fuels and, uh, and technologies and energy used. We have indicative targets for 2030 and for 2030, which are uh, new. Um, so it really is an increase, significant increase of, of ambition compared to 2018 and the result of an, of an important uh, uh, work by, by, by the government to reach uh, this, uh, this agreement by consensus. Linked then to the ambition, is also um, a clear um, uh, a, a clear ambition on the measures and a, a clarity given also on the timelines for the development of the next set of measures. Um, and so IMO agreed to uh, develop this basket of measures delivering on the reduction targets um, and it will comprise uh, both a technical element, uh, some of you have already uh, referred to this, the goal-based marine fuel standard uh, with already some proposals on the table, um, looking into um, the um, GHD intensity of, um, of, of marine fuels, and also a an economic element um, um, on the basis of maritime GHG emissions pricing mechanism, which, um, as you may know, is, is less mature in its development. And so it is expected that the impact assessment will help informing the development of this economic element in particular. Um, this basket of measure is obviously expected to deliver um, on the reduction targets to promote the energy transition of shipping, promote the incentive that's needed. We, it, it's clear that uh, in normal market conditions, uh, uh, th there's no sufficient incentive today to 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 shift towards um, zero or net zero uh, or, or near zero uh, GHG solutions. Um, so this regulatory um, framework is, is is absolutely needed to drive the changes um, and and also contributing to a level playing field and a just and equitable transition. Um, MEPC 80 at the beginning of of July. Um, worked uh, in parallel with the, uh, the the strategy on the development of the measures and in particular on the impact assessment. Um, how to undertake this impact assessment you may have um, seen already and it is, uh, that this, there's still some clarity in terms of the, the, the nature, the scope of, uh, of, of this basket of measures and it and it's going to be clarified in parallel with the comprehensive impact assessment and and we expect the impact, impact assessment to actually inform uh, the development of the measure and the refinement of of the measure and so the the member states have actually developed this this uh, um, uh, matrix of, of measures that are on the table uh, which is supposed to um, encompass all technically possible combinations um, and, and so this is going to be uh, used as the basis for uh, for the impact assessment. I won't go into the details now, but this is uh, just a, a, a snapshot of what we what has been discussed in July. Um, along with this uh, measures matrix, there's further guidance on the conduct of the impact assessment. In particular, those parameters that are needed to set up the various scenarios. Obviously, we will need to work on the basis of scenarios, it's it's a way longer uh, time frame than for the short term measure. There's also more complexity and more uncertainty as to the nature of the measure, uh, and so we need to set up a number of scenarios. Um, and this is just an example, and actually it, it also resonates with some of the discussions we had before. Um, uh, 
for one of the combinations that has been proposed, I can I, I cannot remember exactly which one of, of the combinations this is. Um, we will have to specify um, in the in the uh, assumptions uh, and in, in the preparatory work for the impact assessment a number of parameters uh, such as the level of stringency of the um, fuel standard, the level of the levy, and also how to distribute the revenue for which uses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so all this will determine as. Uh, was kind of implied in the previous discussion, the, the, the outcome of the impact assessment. Um, so in addition, the impact assessment um, should ensure consistency uh, with regard to, um, uh, well, scenarios for uh, well, economic growth scenarios um, uh, and, and, um, and be consistent in order to be comparable, obviously. Um, they need to be in line with the ambitions of the strategy and as I said, um, the impact assessment is expected to inform um, decisions to be taken in the next sessions of the committee, in particular the one that's, uh, take that, that will be held in, in, in March next year on the final selection of the, of the combination of measures. So this impact assessment really is a very important um, element in the, in the um, deliberations that are taking place uh, at, at the IMO. Um, I would like here just also to recall the context for the conduct of the comprehensive impact assessment in terms of methodology. We have a number of elements to be assessed. Um, the guidance, the, methodolo the methodological guidance for such work is largely already um, clarified in what in this uh, circ 885 sorry for the jargon but this is the uh, procedure revised procedure for assessing impacts on states of candidate imo uh, measures uh, which is really which has been developed in, in 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 past sessions but we realize now how what it will be used for and and how important this is going to be uh, mepc 80 also provided some additional guidance um, uh, uh, not the least, the fact that net zero GHG emissions should be reached by 2050 in the context of the uh, of the impact assessment, um, and also the need to quantify the impacts in terms of a country's trade and GDP change. Um, now, when it comes to the, the structure of the comprehensive impact assessment, uh, it largely follows what has been done for the for the uh, short term measure, um, where we will have. Um, at least five tasks, uh, which are distinct but but ho hopefully coherent and interrelated. Uh, literature review, and then uh, a strong link between task two and task three. Um, task three, where we really count on UNCTAD's expertise and leadership to assess the impact of the measure on states. Uh, but for this, UNCTAD colleagues need uh, the the output of the assessment of the impact of the measure on the fleet. Um, and so it's expected that we will follow the same logic for this one, uh, where we will need um, uh, support from from uh, from a contractor to actually assess our consortium of contractors to to assess the impact of the measure on the global uh, fleet. Um, then uh, th there's room for complementary uh, stakeholder analysis, um, including relevant case studies. And finally, the, the, we, we need a section on, on um, uh, well, criteria assurance, quality control, um, uncertainty analysis, et cetera. Um, now, timeline, um, and, and these are going to be my two last slides. Um, we are actually, we have already called uh, for uh, member states to nominate members for what is going to be an important um, uh, body to oversee the conduct of the comprehensive impact assessment, the steering committee. Um, it, it we very soon going to to announce the the the, the list of um, members of this steering committee, and it's expected to um, hold its first meeting on uh, 25, 26 September, um, and decide on a number of elements on on how to conduct this uh, impact assessment until um, 
uh, autumn 2024. So we have we have a year, and I think uh, Anktad colleagues will be happy for that. We have a year uh, ahead of us. It, it is less uh, tight than it, it was for the short term measure. Um, uh, and we have a year before uh, conclusion really of the of the comprehensive impact assessment. Um, so it's expected that in October, November, we will identify the consortium, including uh, on, on assessment of the impact of on fleet and states. So all the actors uh, will be identified by then. We need interim results uh, by the end of the year or early next year in order for um, MEPC 81 in March to um, consider the, the initial findings and adjust the, the, the further assessment based on these results. Um, this, this meeting also is, is important um, as it will inform the, the finalization of the, the combination of the measure. The final report on the uh, impact assessment with the final figures uh, will be considered next September. Um, and uh, on this basis, we expect um, uh, MEPC 83 in uh, spring 2025. It may seem far, but it's actually not that far, uh, uh, given the amount of work that's needed and the complexity of the topic. Um, MEPC 83 is expected to actually approve uh, amendments to MARPOL and X6 on this basket of measures. Um, just a reminder, in parallel, um, MEPC will review the short-term measure. Um, you, you may know that um, uh, the, the committee agreed that this, this short-term measure adopted in 2021 will have to be uh, reviewed, and we actually need to, and this includes CII, EEXI, um, and we will uh, need in particular to agree on um, the reduction factors for CII for the for 2027 uh, to 2030. Then following the approval of amendments, um, six months at least six months after this, uh, and we will need to uh, uh, hold an extraordinary session of uh, MEPC in autumn uh, 2025 to formally uh, adopt these amendments, and then. Uh, as usual, there's a circulation uh, acceptance period, which is uh, which is 16 months after adoption, and and then we expect this uh, this basket of measure to enter into force in uh, in 2027. So this is really, um, I think, Jan, you you asked me to present the the IMO plans. I think I think this clarifies what are the IMO plans. Um, if there's any question, I'm happy to take them. Aide is, is here as well, so feel free to uh, to ask questions. But we're in your hands, uh, Jan, you are you are the chair. You're the chair for today. Yeah, I can mute and unmute people. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Camille and, and IMO for joining us here in this update. Uh, also for us, this was a good summary and reminder of because we participate in so many meetings, but sometimes I have the feeling I no longer see the forest uh, after having been presented with all these little trees and I think there was a very good summary. Uh, Isabel from the World Bank, any questions to our IMO colleagues? Yes, thank you Jan and thank you so much for the invitation. Um, thanks Camille, that was super helpful. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned that there's going to be some preparatory work in which the input par parameters are going to be determined. Did I get that right? Okay, I see you nodding. Yes, so essentially, uh, hi Isabel, the idea is that the first meeting of the steering committee, will. this is actually one of the key decisions that will have to be, take, to be, to be taken um, because some of, the, some of the parameters are, um, I would say, combination related, uh, are specific to each combination, but some of the parameters are kind of fixed. I mean, uh, economic growth scenarios, socioeconomic growth scenarios. This this will have to be the same for all for all the, the scenarios. So um, this meeting is going to take a number of decisions, but this is this is indeed one of the important decisions that that needs to be taken at at the beginning of the process. Uh, otherwise, um, the the consortium will have difficulties in in actually uh, initiating the work. Yeah, I totally agree. And in particular, I was I was interested to hear 
how the stringency of the measures is going to be determined, given that they all have to essentially end at the same uh, end goal of zero by 2050 mm. and, and meet all of the relevant levels of ambitions and interim targets. So I was wondering how that is going to be determined. And then also, mm. I think you also mentioned that the uh, in this prep work, the revenue distribution keys will be determined. And I'm wondering how that's going to work, given that the the actual revenue the actual revenue discussion has been postponed or to phase three, which is which has just started, and but there hasn't really been any discussion. So, just wondering how logistically this is all going to work, how analytically the mm. the stringency levels are going to be determined. Yes. So, should I take this one, Jan, directly? Or? Yeah, yeah. Please, uh, if if you have the answer, that would be yeah, well. I think. <laughs> no, I, I mean it, it's clear that they would. So. I think it's it's inevitable that we will need a number of scenarios, and that there will be many variables. Uh, and, and I'm sorry for the for the modelers that will work on this one, but there will definitely be more variables than for the for the short term measure. Um, and and this is where the parameters that have been identified during MEPC are helpful. Um, yeah, so uh, now I, I don't think we will need to 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 identify necessarily all of them, um, and 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 also one of these one of the for example when it comes to the um, to the to, to the levy we, we we may have to take some 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 margins or some some a range of a range of of, of uh, possible possible levies same for the uh, for the um, uh, fuel standard. Um, but it needs to be clear from the beginning, and and that's where we need the governance. As ultimately, this um, uh, work has been requested by the governments to inform their decision. We need the governments that are in the steering committee to actually agree on on these parameters uh, and on, on on the set of scenarios um, in order to uh, yeah to 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 be on this well on the same page. And and, and this again. Um, is expected to be the IMO impact assessment agreed by 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 all. So it um, it's it's important that um, again to, going back to what I said at the beginning to 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 involve um, as 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 much as possible uh, a, a wide number of uh, of organisations, governments, uh, research institutions, um, and so we 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 actually envisage that this steering committee meeting will be. Uh, open to observer organizations as well. Um, so, uh, well, again, you you will see the the invitation letter sent to all uh, formally, uh, probably uh, in the beginning of next week. But we expect indeed uh, uh, the the a wide participation to the steering committee as well. And I haven't mentioned that we for. Uh, Further to the to, to the first meeting of the steering committee in September, we then we then probably need frequent meetings every every month or so uh, to to oversee the work. ID, you want to correct anything Camille said? Hi Jan, hi Isabel. <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. Um, uh, just to go back a little bit to your stringency question. So, as you all know, the the new revised strategy has different levels of ambition. So we expect that the modelers will take on new new policy scenarios, and this would include 2030, 2040, and 2050, and also regarding uh, your second question on how revenues are, are going to, to be worked at, the um, matrix number one in the appendix to the terms of reference for the comprehensive impact assessment of the basket of midterm measures already ambitions um, different uh, options for disbursement of revenues. So we are expecting that the modelers would, would take this into account. Discussions that, um, well, negotiations at IMO uh, stemming from different submissions have been discussing, uh, you know, in sector, out of sector revenue use, but the matrix um, has has different, um, different, um, um, 
areas. Uh, so we have to address uh, disproportionate negative impacts for uh, capacity building. So uh, the modelers would have to uh, work on this matrix as well as the others that are part of the appendix. I hope uh, this helps. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aide. Um, we have 35 minutes left. I'm very happy really how we have been able to combine like what has been done so far. We have learned from different studies, uh, every study looking at some different angle, but overall I think they all make sense and they are not really contradicting each other. They are looking at different aspects of the big elephant. Then we had the update from where do we stand today at the IMO, the process, like what is it and how will we analysis? And uh, next uh, step um, is now like next last half hour, the, the future. Um, on the agenda, I already had some volunteers, uh, from, uh, Rico and Isabel from the World Bank to look at some aspects that World Bank has been looking at some things to consider. Harry Laos was volunteered to give some aspects uh, to consider. I would be happy to hear others as, as well. Um, I don't know, uh, Sarah or other colleagues from Copenhagen. Ingrid raised her hand. Uh, Ronald, you just raised your hand. I don't know if David Hamels wants to say something about models. But we only have half an hour, so I would really like to make this a very, very quick brainstorming. We, we don't have time for a lot of back and forth, but really throw ideas at us of, of uh, yeah. <laughs> when Camille said, oh, we have more time than the last time, yeah, but it's also a much bigger hill we have to climb. So I'm I'm not as relaxed as as you might imply. So we, we, and and by adding more questions now we may make it more complex. But but please, I, I would like to really have the last half hour with a lot of brainstorming. What are your takeaways from what we've heard so far? Experiences, studies done so far. Where do we stand, and what do we need to consider? So I will start with what we had on the agenda, um, which was, I believe, first Isabel and Rico and then Harry Laos, and then I will continue with those who are raising their hands. Uh, Ingrid would then be the next one. Isabel or Rico, who of the two? Yes, it's it's going to be me today or okay. today again. Um, okay. quickly. I've got two or three slides, but nothing too big, and we mainly wanted to um, bring up some questions. Um, but yeah, hopefully they're helpful. Um, so a lot of you might fami be familiar with this um, with this graphic. So essentially, two years ago, we've assessed several um, carbon revenue use options against a number of criteria, and these criteria included the need to address disproportionately negative impacts. So when Jan, when you asked us to to reflect on on the impact of of different carbon revenue use options, we thought we'd do that from the perspective of um, their potential to address disproportionately negative impacts. And so in our analysis um, two years ago, we found that some carbon revenue uses are more aligned than others. And those are the ones that you can see on this slide, namely supporting shipping decarbonization, enhancing maritime transport infrastructure and capacity, and financing broader climate goals. And all three of them can help with addressing um, disproportionately negative impacts, but they can do that in different ways. So starting from the top, um, if you invest funds into decarbonizing shipping, that can lower the costs of decarbonization, which then means that the policies um, that are needed to, to drive decarbonization could be less stringent. And as a result, that would um, bring about lower disproportionately negative impacts. And so therefore, this option would help to avoid disproportionate negative impacts before they occur. Um, and then if you use funds to enhance maritime transport infrastructure and capacity, that can help to lower maritime transport costs and therefore offset at least some of the cost increases due to the implementation of the measures. So again, that can help to avoid disproportionate negative impacts before they occur. Uh, we also refer to this as ex ante addressing of DNI. Um, but then finally, carbon revenues can also be channeled to countries that are affected by DNI without necessarily having to avoid DNI directly. So that could, for example, mean spending revenues on broader climate uh, mitigation and adaptation activities. Um, however, because all three options can create value in the countries uh, in which they would be used in, um, they can remedy disproportionate negative impacts in those affected countries. 
Um, and in preparation for today, we wanted to understand how the revenue use options uh, that have to be modeled under the matrix correspond to the ones that we have identified as key options. And so we projected these our three options onto the matrix just to have a look. And as you can see, sorry, it's a slightly complex slide. Um, the matrix partially hints towards um, these three options. However, the focus in the matrix um, seems to be on decarbonizing shipping. And whilst that's obviously very important, this could come with some challenges related to um, using revenues if you want to address disproportionate negative impacts. And that's because not every country may have spending opportunities related to decarbonizing shipping, uh, for example, building up uh, zero carbon fuel infrastructure and the value chain, et cetera. And that is likely to include some countries which could be affected by uh, disproportionate negative impacts like SIDS and LDCs, which, um, of course, the previous uh, CIA showed were more affected by, by the short term measures. <clears throat> so if the focus of revenue use is on decarbonizing shipping only, it's likely that not all countries that could be affected by DNI would also be able to address these through revenues. Um, then we've also noticed that there seems to be a pretty strong focus towards supporting OPEX costs. However, we know that the capital investments um, will be pretty large. So the need for capital investments will be large, especially for the land side infrastructure. So that's maybe also something to, to think about. Um, and then another thing uh, we've noticed relates to revenues for negative impact mitigation and equitable transition, um, because these appear to somehow follow a different logic. Uh, and we argue that as a result of different activities, um, you can address disproportionate negative impacts and equity concerns, um, whereas the matrix presents DNI and equitable transition as separate activities without really specifying what those activities would be. So I think it would probably be good, maybe, and that could be maybe as part of this um, first steering committee workshop, um, I think it would be good to clarify what activities exactly should be supported um, by the revenues in order to achieve those objectives. Um, and then several proposals also include um, admin as a revenue use option. And um, I guess this is going to be a little bit easier to model because you just essentially need to take out a chunk of the money, but you need to know how much money you need. So, um, and I guess on the one hand, you need to, to estimate how much resources will be needed to administer the measure, but also the fund that manages the revenues. And here we just wanted to suggest to perhaps have a look at the operating expenses of existing climate and development funds to kind of yeah, give a ballpark figure of how much um, might be needed. Um, so yeah, we've come up with a couple of questions um, that we think it would be interesting to discuss um, either here or in the or in the um, steering committee workshop. So the first one was: At what stages do revenues need to be factored in in the modeling process to either prevent or remedy disproportionate negative impacts and um, so do we maybe already have to factor learning curves from, for example, R&D spending into the um, transport cost increases that then feed into the, 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 the other model? Um, but then also what split between revenue use options um, can the modeling assume? And what split between countries for revenue allocation could be assumed? And here we were also wondering if there's any good practices that could be employed um, and related to question two and three, we were also wondering and sorry for just bringing up question after question. Um, but I guess one key question is also how the revenues would be dispersed. Would it just be it, like in reality, would it just be based on like a distribution key or would there be a bidding and allocation model? Because that is then obviously going to have pretty strong implications on where the revenue would go, both in terms of use option and countries. Um, and then lastly, um, we're wondering how activities that are more difficult to quantify could be translated into an economic model. So for example, how do you quantify um, the impacts and benefits of capacity building? Um, so yeah, sorry for just bringing up lots of questions, but those were kind of the, the ideas that we had when we started thinking about this. 
Thank you very much, um, Isabel and, and team. Um, yes, that is what we are afraid of. So we answer some questions and get uh, squared more questions. <laughs> um, no, much appreciated. A very important angle about the, the scope, but also yeah, why it is so important to look at different aspects of the economic measures, uh, because there is revenue generated, which can be made to very good use. And I, I think it's very important, very positive, the work that the World Bank has been doing in, in this regard, supporting this very important transition. Um, next on my list is Harry Laos. He has not raised his hand, but he is on the agenda, so he will jump the queue um, to share some yeah. thoughts about aspects to consider. Harry Laos. And thereafter, I go, as, as you raised your hands, Ingrid, then David Hamels, then Ronald. Thank you. Uh, can you see this uh, screen uh, now, Jan? Yes, I can see 10 cents. Okay, so I'll, three, I'll give you my 10 cents or two cents a minute. And if I take more than five minutes, it's going to be less than uh, two cents a minute. So, so I'll try to, <laughs> I'll try to. Uh, uh, so uh, I, what I will do is to describe um, very shortly our involvement in an impact assessment. I briefly talk about other impact assessments and why they may yield different results, and then uh, talk about the prospects for the impact assessment to be, as per the last uh, MEPC. So, but first, the big question: Where was I on the in the previous meeting on the 14th of uh, December of 2020, which was the so unfortunately, I missed it. I was on an airplane uh, going to Athens, and there was no way that I could reschedule my flight. That was uh, right after the start of COVID. And uh, we were involved in a study, an impact assessment study that was submitted just before COVID, February 2020. It was uh, on uh, the detailed impact assessment of the short-term measure uh, submitted by Denmark, France, and Germany. The authors, uh, in addition to myself, were Thalizis, who was uh, at the time with DTU, and uh, Ronald, uh, Ronald Halim. And um, uh, due to uh, time constraints, we focused on uh, three uh, uh, geographical, if you will, uh, regions. It was South America, India, and then there was a special chapter on LDCs and SIDS, and you can see here uh, the table of, of contents. Uh, I note that this concerned only the CII component of the short-term measure because at the time EXI was a competitor measure. It was promoted by Japan and Norway. And later in the fall of uh, 2020, uh, MEPC 75 decided to combine. So you had the EXI, SEMP, CII, and also at the time uh, MEPC decided to conduct a comprehensive impact assessment of the combined measure. We managed to produce two papers out of this um, impact assessment, one uh, focused on LDCs and SEEDs, and the other focused on, on South America. Uh, very briefly, the basic results for South America and India, we identified the low or no risk of negative impacts. In fact, we identified some positive impacts mainly in the form of reduction of fuel consumption, you reduce speed, you reduce fuel consumption, and you potentially reduce fuel costs and freight rates, and this could translate into benefits for imports and exports of the countries involved. On the other hand, for LDCs and SIDS, it was a different story. We found definitely some risk of negative and even disproportionately negative impacts. Then uh, the fall of uh, that year, UNCTAD uh, reviewed uh, all the impact assessments that were uh, were submitted, and then a year later, uh, as uh, Jan uh, described, uh, UNCTAD did their own uh, comprehensive impact assessment. And there, were, there have been uh, other impact assessments. Uh, some uh, some were described earlier, but the, the, even before that, there have been many prior studies in the literature assessing impact of carbon pricing on states, and also uh, all the proposals of the medium-term measures that were submitted recently uh, uh, submitted their own impact assessment of these measures and of other measures, for example, uh, impact of a levy. And uh, uh, we all know that there was an expert workshop in May, uh, a comparative assessment of the midterm measures. Uh, why do the, uh, the results differ? There are a number of reasons. First, they may, they may be assessing different things. 
So uh, the combined measure is a different measure than uh, a carbon levy. Therefore, uh, you would expect that the impact might be different. And also, uh, we're talking here about the combined levy uh, fuel standard measure. Uh, then you would, you, would, you would expect the results to be different. Also, differences in input data. So one question I have here is, can we at least agree on the input? Uh, to have a common a common uh, input uh, because there are lots of disagreements here. Can we at, at least agree on the input? And also there might be differences in modeling approach, assumptions, methods, etc. Now, what is what's going to be? And uh, the, 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 was a very interesting presentation by the IMO. Uh, what are the main challenges? In my opinion, uh, the, the first challenge is what is it really to be assessed? In my opinion, this is not very well defined uh, in the sense that the economic measure is not well defined. The technical measure, which is a fuel standard, is, is, is not well defined. This this issue of offsetting, well, whether offsetting should be allowed or uh, should be uh, not allowed. There was a discussion about that at the IMO, but the IMO, uh, the, 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 there is no resolution on that. So the, there's a big difference if offsetting is allowed versus if offsetting is not allowed. And also there are other um, uncertainties like uh, the timeline is imprecise, as I say, close to 2050. And of course, the, the, the issue of how to distribute the revenues is very difficult and there are highly divergent views on impact and measures. And this was shown before by, by Camille, the measures matrix, uh, which has uh, all these items here, disbursement of revenues and uh, technical measure elements, et cetera, et cetera. And a, a, a great number of combinations and, and parameters for combinations. I, I personally admit I had a great difficulty uh, uh, figuring out what needs to be done. So whoever undertakes this, this, this study, the modelers will have to navigate through, through this, what seems, at least in my opinion, a rather difficult uh, field. And uh, the, 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 there's a need to to, uh, to to be more specific on many of these uh, these items. So I, I uh, so um, uh, that was actually my five minutes. I have, we have a, a number of papers. This is actually an, a, a sample of the papers we have written in the subject of decarbonization. And uh, that was my five minutes. Uh, I hope. Thank you very much. And uh, maybe I can uh, I can. Uh, uh, Stop sharing my screen. Right. <laughs> I'll be Thank happy you. to answer any questions. Yeah, yeah. no, thanks a lot, uh, Harry Laos. I think that was actually very good, good summary of the, the storyline and the context of also this brainstorming. Um, I ha now have four more people on, on the speaker list and we have only 15 minutes left. So I would need to close the list now. I have Ingrid, then David, then Ronald, and then Sarah, last but not least. Um, and then we have to conclude. Um, before I, I forget, there, there were a couple of comments again about the Dropbox link working or not working. It was for some, it did not seem to work. I'm, I'm, I mean, I think it worked for most. We have seen people downloading. If it no longer works, we will have to try, I don't know, those who, it does not work. We have to work by email, uh, find other links, uh, transfer via vTransfer or Google Drive. Or, or, but I don't know, with su such a large number of participants, maybe you have different security settings. Who knows? But it has worked 98% in the past. It'll work again. Having said this, uh, yeah, Ingrid, you have the floor. And really thanks for all this collaboration also generally with the Global Maritime Forum and, and all this. I think we are very much shooting in the same direction. Thanks for joining. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, uh, Jan, and thanks for the invitation and, and uh, good to see everyone uh, on this call. Um, there's been a, a lot of interesting uh, presentations and, and comments and and um, I'm not a modeler, but, uh, but, I, but I've, I've still found this very useful. So I don't have a presentation, but I have a few comments that I wanted to send along uh, as you pick up this this important work. So one reflection I had is um, uh, how to uh, consider the, the counterfactual in this work, uh, meaning that um, so I had a, the, the chance to, to attend the MEPC meeting and listening to the opening statements. And there was a lot of resistance against uh, an economic instrument and a levy in particular. 
Um, so, so what I wonder is, is it possible to think about what would happen if there is no uh, or only a weak economic instrument? Um, because I think that there's a fair chance that then um, countries will uh, go ahead with pricing mechanisms on a national or regional level. So can that to some uh, can that somehow be taken into account in in the in the modeling work? Um, then I wanted to also send along the opportunities also related to this revised greenhouse gas strategy, and in particular when it comes to the uh, fuel production, um, which can you know there's great potential for fuel production to become more uh, distributed uh, going forward with the with the huge needs of green uh, hydrogen in particular. So uh, when we look at how uh, uh, trade in in commodities that we know how that will be affected by um, by the the new strategy. Uh, can we also find a way of looking at you know new commodities and uh, model how that trade will will look? Uh, and I think that that's particularly relevant because many of the countries that are concerned about uh, DNI uh, also are ones that have a, a really great uh, renewable energy potential. Uh, related to that question, uh, I also wanted to send along um, that, you know, when we shift to new fuels, the bunkering will become more, or the bunkering stops will become more frequent, which also means that there's an opportunity for more countries to position themselves as bunkering hubs. How do we capture that in, in the modeling? Um, Again, uh, along the similar lines of thinking, uh, there is going to be a lot of scope for uh, new cargo when we shift to new energy. Um, so how will that be captured in the model? Um, because that's also part of the dynamic uh, effects. Um, so those were a few things that I wanted to send along. And then I also wanted to you know, make an offer to, to those of you who will be doing this work, uh, if there's anything we can do to help um, reach out to industry. Uh, we are happy to to do what we can to, you know, if there's a survey or interviews or something like that. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Ingrid. Uh, very positive, very important. Uh, just before this meeting, I had gotten an email from Rasmus from Trafigura, who unfortunately could not join. He's also sitting on a plane right now, uh, like Harry Laos at the last meeting. And, and he was also very much in line with what you just said, Ingrid, very strongly saying, look, if we do not get a clear economic measure, he said nothing else will become um, com competitive. Uh, and the opportunity is certainly something we have also, we have worked on together. We have actually at the next COP, another joint event with the IMO and other partners, which also will look at these opportunities. And then, of course, I, I, I've bitten my tongue so far, but I have to reiterate something we have highlighted frequently at the IMO, um, the, uh, that the delay is more costly than any measure it, itself, which we could go on about. Um, I bite my tongue here, and uh, Gavin, you're not forgotten. You're right. I saw. I said I will give you the floor. I didn't include you in my list, but you are on the list. Gavin, you are. You will be the last, but not least, after Sarah and now David. David Hammes, you have the floor. Uh, thanks. Really appreciate the opportunity to to share some thoughts and listen to everybody. Um, uh, just a couple of things in terms of the impact assessment um, that I think are worth considering that I don't think were part of the presentations earlier. The first, and this is something Jan alluded to, is you know the possibility of mode switching. Um, so a couple of my former PhD students have a provocative paper out suggesting that there's a, you know, it doesn't it doesn't take much cargo switching onto planes before you unravel the the carbon emission reductions that you get through maritime, uh, and so so those effects can be quite profound when uh, a kilogram takes a hundred times more uh, carbon emissions to put on a plane than a boat, so um, so I think it I think it's worth contemplating how significant that is and and so there's one paper on this uh, that is is provocative but it's worth I think following on that uh, a second related piece is is uh, is connected to something that Ingrid just mentioned and that is I think it, it's worth considering what 
effect we expect to see on route structures. Um, some of this is about bunkering, but it's also about an effective reduction in the capacity of the fleet, um, the willingness of, of carriers to enter onto spoke routes. Uh, and, you know, um, I, I, think, I think there's a, particularly when we think about the impact across different countries, countries that are uh, at some remove from, uh, from the main, from the more heavily traded routes, um, we know that those things are, are, those routes are sensitive to cargo volumes and to the willingness of shippers to, to serve kind of off route, uh, off main route uh, uh, veins. And so um, what that could do in terms of uh, the competitiveness of some of those routes, as well as how frequently uh, liner ships move along them, um, those effects could be quite pronounced uh, for some smaller and more remote countries. Um, and then a, a kind of final point that is is difficult to take on in this context, but which I nevertheless think will be potentially important. Um, th there have been quite profound changes in the in the structure of tariffs over the last few years. Um, by all indications, those are likely to continue. Um, we've seen in the U.S., for example, a fairly profound increase in, um, uh, in air shipping to get around uh, tariffs imposed on China uh, through some other channels that uh, enable you to avoid those tariffs. So the the intersection of the changing trade policy environment with the with the transportation sector, I think, is something that's worth um, considering. So I'll stop there. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, David. Uh, many interesting things. We could go into a lot of detail. Please, uh, if, if you don't mind, uh, the, the, uh, I think the paper you mentioned, I think I have it already included in the background reading, but I'm not sure. Just in case, make sure it's it's there. I'll put it in the chat. Same for colleagues. Uh, uh, I see my dear colleague Ono just joined. Ono, we have closed the list of speakers. Uh, I, I know you had warned me you might be late. Uh, <laughs> Ono, if you don't mind, put in the in the chat and we also put in the Dropbox later because you have some really nice updates about our UNCTAD work on transport costs, but but we are now a little too late to include it here in the presentation. But this is something which a project we started with the World Bank in support of the IMO process, which uh, Ono is, is leading here, the statistics work. So Ono, if you don't mind, sorry, I can't give you the floor, but put one or two links to your latest paper and to our data set, the ongoing work in the chat. Having said this, thank you, David. Now, Ronald. Thank you, Jörn. Um, the question I have is more related to also what has been presented uh, by the World Bank, Isabel, with regard to the use of revenue to prevent negative impact. I think this is an interesting concept, but I uh, cannot get around in uh, more detail how the mechanism uh, exactly would look like because as we know that the revenue uh, can only be raised when when the carbon levy is implemented and when it is implemented technically there is going to be uh, an immediate impact on transport costs and if we talk about um, alleviation of negative impacts such as reduction in transport costs through um, for example improvement in port infrastructure the the funding that's needed to um, basically develop uh, port infrastructure or zero carbon fuel supply chain systems for that for that matter will be quite high and and certainly this will require um, income or from those that can be generated from from carbon revenue for example um, that is my question and just also acknowledging what uh, David has mentioned with regard to several aspects that need to be taken into account I agree model shift is one of the issues that is worth considering and and route shift as well because this can affect port competitiveness uh, especially among competing ports um, um, and uh, on top of that i think uh, what i like to stress out is the heterogeneous proportion of maritime transport costs to the total logistics costs across the routes worldwide because um, i believe this is what also will uh, cause heterogeneous impacts across different routes and commodities. Uh, as we know that not all routes uh, will have high proportion of, of maritime transport costs. We have also port costs that can be very high depending on the efficiency of, of the port in, in different countries. So um, typically in developing countries or countries with poorer port infrastructure will have more expensive port costs and this is actually part of the CIF and FOB 
value that that is paid by the shipper. So it is useful to uh, to isolate the impact of the measures on maritime transport costs only um, to not overestimate the impact. So to speak. Thank you. Yeah, cool. No, thanks. A lot of very valid aspects and and in line with what what others just said. The aspects of that. Uh, David also had mentioned and Isabel. Um, roughing, roughing, um, Sarah, almost last words. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to share some thoughts uh, from what I've heard so far. So um, I really enjoyed listening to all the studies um, and I think that there's a lot in each and every one of them to build on. However, the challenge that we stand in front of now when we are to do an impact assessment analysis is that we do have the emissions to consider whether we use an eco uh, economic measure or a technical measure. But that actually means, since it is a curve that changes and goes towards zero, that ship owners need to take into account um, the future in the behavior and decisions already today. So it quickly becomes much more complicated, complex when you do modeling um, because, um, well, some of the fuels we expect to be needed in the future in order to um, fulfill and, and reach this target are not even commercially available today. Um, so how do ship owners take that into account and how does that translate in terms of uh, costs and so on? So the TCO for uh, a ship and a fuel pathway is much more important in this study than before. Um, and of course, we are more than than, than willing to, to help with that. Um, I also just want to say that um, the availability of fuels will differ largely across uh, regions in the world. So um, cost differences will, uh, are expected to be huge. So also taking that into account when assessing impact uh, on countries. Um, previous studies has largely focused on the effect of speed. If you translate that to um, how we can achieve emission reductions, we need to, to, to be aware that it's a inversely exponential curve, meaning that we probably seen the largest effects already. You can't decrease uh, speed and continue it at that rate that you have modeled before, and you will definitely not expect to see the same amount of emissions reductions. Um, also, when it comes to the technical measure, I haven't really come around to, to understand whether we are to assess equal in assumptions on all ships or if such as in the fuel EU where you allowed, uh, allowed pooling. If you allow pooling, you can even imagine that you have a pooling um, in terms of regions or so, and then you could argue that, that all fossil ships could just continue, um, for example, in the SIDS, et cetera, for a certain time period. Is that what we are to model? Then I agree with Ingrid on the um, transport costs that I definitely think that we should assess um, the new market that comes uh, in terms of fuel production and new commodities. Um, uh, and that is really important. However, I disagree with Ingrid when it comes to the bunkering and that that will be more frequent and in more places because you can equally argue the opposite, that we will have bunkering hubs and that you need to bunker only in, in fewer places, but that you need to know where which type of fuel can be available, etc. And I think I'll stop there, but I'll probably have uh, inspired some more thoughts from your side. Thank you. Fantastic. Th thank you very much, Sarah, also for the collaboration. Um, good. Yeah, no, the question about um, more or fewer banking. So I think David had brought it up. Um, I mean, logically, if the alternative fuel has lower energy and density, you normally would go a shorter distance with the same volume of tank, I, I think. But all these are interesting things to be discussed. Now, 
the the this transition we are looking at we are working it's really the biggest transition for flipping in in decades if you compare it to the first transition going from wind to coal then from coal to oil and not from oil to given you have the floor to wind again i was just i was just nodding my head around the the transition you know from uh from, from sale, wind to sale to from coal, sail yeah, to coal, from coal to oil, and Gavin, you have the last words. Yeah, and that and that took over a, over a century, and we are condensing it down into twenty years with a fleet that's multiple times larger. Um, yeah, I just uh, I've I've actually just sent you uh, a whole list of questions around the assumptions that underlie the. Um, uh, the 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 baselines that are used in these studies, you know, where we have very heavy um, uh, subsidies for fossil fuels already in place. We have out of sector subsidies going into alternative fuels being developed. So there's there's a real um, issue around what baseline you use and what 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 um, parameters and externalities are included into that baseline. Otherwise, if we if we select a baseline that is is um, if you like business as usual, then we're actually ignoring a huge amount of externalities that are uh, delivered for free into a into the system. So, so that's one issue I just wanted to mention. The other one is around there is a a very strong tendency to always look at fuel and always look at fuel costs. Wind wind has been mentioned uh, a couple of times, but it actually uh, plugging in a free energy source. Um, fundamentally changes the economics around um, acceptable routes and can change behavior as well. So um, I've, I've suggested, you know, maybe looking at uh, scenarios on the pathways that, sh that, that the fleet will actually decide upon. Will it be a, a fuel only pathway? Will it be fuel plus CCS? Will it be wind plus uh, energy efficiency plus fuel? That there are quite a few different scenarios here on the reaction of the fleet to the measure itself. Um, and those, it could be a very mixed picture there. Um, but if we just focus on fuel only, I think we're, we're missing uh, quite a big on the uh, uh, change on the behavioral uh, level. And that goes with the routing as well. So, um, and the, the other point I just wanted to make was. Um, around the, the way that each of the segments uh, reacts differently. So the tanker Volker segment may be able to take a lot of wind propulsion, for example, will react very differently to say um, uh, the existing container fleet. Um, so I think that that is a really important aspect where it's not, again, it's not just fuel decisions, but behavior. And the, the last point is the external behavior as well, that uh, carbon, um, emissions or other emissions, total emission reductions are engendering within the customer, customer base. So we've got large companies now stepping forward and saying we will be net zero or zero emissions by 2040. Um, we will not use ships that are heavy emitters. Now that again completely changes the parameters in which the MBMs will be operating. And, and I think we really need to consider those aspects because we're actually looking at a measure that won't even be in place for another five years. Um, from what I can understand, the revenues won't be actually here before 2029, probably. So that's quite a, a, a forward looking uh, assessment. And if we're using hind cast trade um, uh, details and uh, emissions details, we could see a, quite a fundamental shift within that five years. So having some flexibility around that that forecasting as well. But I won't, I, I've written quite a lot of other things. I'll put that in an email to you, Jan, and more than happy to discuss this with the group uh, uh, later. Thank you. You are muted, uh, Jan. Jan, you're Sorry. muted. Finally. finally. Uh, finally, I forgot to unmute. Uh, good, but you could imagine what I was going to say. I wanted to thank all of you on behalf of uh, UNCTAD. Uh, the, as I said at the outset, this was an UNCTAD ad hoc expert meeting, part of our work program to help us with our work, with the intention to help 
you, you meaning member states, partners, partner organizations. Uh, this is definitely a very important topic. I'm preaching to the converted. You are here because you, you agreed. We will keep this group live through email, Dropbox. Maybe we keep that same uh, invitee list for a uh, future meeting. Um, for now, time is up. I just want to ask you to put two dates in your agendas. 28th September, uh, the Angta de Revie of My Time Transport 2023 will be launched. There will not be a launch event. There will afterwards be several dissemination events, but from the 28th onwards in the morning, it will be online. It will have a special chapter on decarbonization of shipping. Watch that space. Uh, it's going to be very interesting. Lots of interesting data, including also Torbjörn was here from Marine Benchmark. Uh, so it went beyond the impact, but that's 28th September. And then please also mark your agenda for 21st to 24th of May next year, where we are organizing a global supply chain forum together with the government of Barbados, including many of the topics that are relevant here. There will be parallel streams. We will look at trade station, at decarbonization, at SITS issues, at climate change adaptation issues, uh, sustainable shipping, port reform. I mean, it's really going to be a very big global supply chain forum um, where we collaborate with different agents. We hope to have parallel sessions, uh, special breakout sessions. So these are my last words, the last sales pitch as I have you on the screen in front of me, 28 September and 21 to 24 May. And in between those dates, we'll stay in touch. And I thank you again for this very, very important, very fascinating exchange. Thank you all very much. And I guess my teams will now stop very soon the recording until we have all waved at each other and said thanks. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Yeah,